Morning, this conference Lord. will now be recorded. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Hi, Good morning, everyone. Hi there. Hi, Director Gray. Hi. Good morning, Director Gray. Good morning, Director Deer. Well, Good morning, Chairman Gray. Past 11, so are we going to have a quorum for our meeting? We have it now. No. No, we don't. We don't have the queue. No. Um, no, we don't have a quorum, but we do not have any action items today, so we can um, uh, consider all the information and move it forward to receive and file. Uh, Director Houston uh, will not be joining us, and um, Director Alvarez, I just spoke to him. He's uh, working on a project, and he can't join us at this time. He may join later. Okay, very well then. Then we will go ahead and, and get the meeting underway. Okay, um, I, want to, I want to thank everyone for uh, showing up today and, and coming to participate. And uh, this is the um, Public Information and Education Committee meeting on uh, the Special Board of the West Basin Municipal Water District, April 8th, and it is now 11.02. Now we um, we the meeting. I call the meeting to order. And uh, determination of a quorum. We do not have a quorum. We do not have a quorum. How about uh, public comment? Public comment. I'm sorry, I was muted. We do not have any public comment. Then that takes us to. Um, uh presentations any presentations uh no presently. what is that that is an echo <laughs> there's okay. somebody from somebody um calling in okay so now we're at action items action calendar yes we do not have any action items today president williams Okay, then that takes us to item six, information calendar. Yes. And I will turn this over to the uh, general manager. Uh, thanks again, um, President Williams, members of the board, um, members of the public and uh, staff that are on here. I do, I do have a request for you, President Williams. Um, I would like to take item E, the water bottle filling station update first. Um, sorry for the, if that's okay. Sorry, Janelle, we'll get to you right after. Um, and I think we have uh, our water policy and resource analyst too. Tammy, are you on, on the line? Yes, I am. Good are you ready to roll? I just got that text from EJ with this request. So EJ, if we're ready to roll, uh, and, and Tammy, go ahead and take this update on, uh, on our water bottle filling station program. Hi, Leticia. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. So for a brief update on the water bottle filling station, uh, this is to provide an update through activities through March. And last month I reported on several activities in, involving outreach and communications and marketing this program. I also reported that the signage was mailed for all agencies that already have their stations installed. And since then, I followed up with those agencies and everyone has received their signs. And so today's presentation will provide a status overview on activities within the past few weeks. And first, we will start with slide three, which is on page 66 of the board packet. And on that page, it indicates the agencies that have not yet completed construction. Um, these have yet to be installed largely due to agency closures and minimal staffing levels during the past several months, and this is as a result of the pandemic. And for those stations that have not yet been installed, I can provide a status update. So with regard to the application from St. Philomena School, they need to place an order for the water, billing, water bottle filling station, and that's what they are doing right now. I talked to them a couple of weeks ago. Um, next is the City of Rolling Hills Estate. They have two outdoor units on order and are currently awaiting delivery, and they will provide us with photos after the units have been installed. Regarding the City of Lomita, the location for the second station changed from their original location that was indicated on their application 
And at this time, it has not yet been confirmed if the other station has been installed. However, their staff is checking with others at the agency regarding the status. For the city of Redondo Beach, they received the signs that we provided for their stations located at the aviation gym, and they have affixed the signs. The new station to be located at the pier is scheduled to be completed by the end of July 2021. Regarding Culver City, the construction for West Park is anticipated to be completed within the next month. And for Culver City Unified School District, their construction is still underway. For the city of El Segundo, they received the signs that we provided last month for their stations that have already been installed. And for their two new stations, they have one unit under construction and the other unit is back ordered. So next on slide four, uh, page 67 of the packet, it shows a few agencies that we are preparing signage for. And these include the city of Lawndale, Los Angeles Unified School District, and the Manhattan Beach Unified School District. So our team members in the Public Information Department are currently preparing the design work for these signs that will include each agency's logo. And so moving on to slide six, uh, it shows on page 69, it shows a list of all of the applications that we are reviewing right now for completeness. For the city of Lawndale, it's located in Division 5. This will be located at the Lawndale Community Center. And this agency has requested $1,000 for an indoor station. For the city of Gardena, also within Division 5, this will be located at Rowley Park. This will be an outdoor water bottle filling station to be installed next to the auditorium, and they are requesting $1,000. For the city of Malibu, uh, located in Division 4, they are designing a new skate park and are requesting $2,000 for an outdoor water bottle filling station. So for review of these applications, an evaluation panel involves the staff within the water policy and public information departments. And this is a collective effort to ensure that each application meets the goals and objectives of the program with a thorough review. And then finally, uh, next slide, uh, it shows the budget for this program and it considers the recent applications that have been received. So moving forward, updates will continue to be provided on a monthly basis, and this budget table will be updated as new applications are received and approved. So that concludes this report, and I would be happy to address any questions that you may have. Thank you, Tammy. All right, directors. Director Deer. Oh, uh, no. No, for me, very good. Thank you very much. I do have one thank question, you. Director. Oh, I'm sorry, Director Gray. Yeah. Uh, are we any? Uh, are we? Uh, uh, can we possibly lose our funding if we don't use it in a certain time period? I don't remember what the time period was for the grant funding, or if we have any, any exit, any uh, date where we have to use the funding. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, EJ will has the information on that at his fingertips, I know. Yes, thank you, Patrick and, and Director Gray. That's a great question. Uh, in past years, what, what staff has tried to do is remain and, uh, and, and add some consistency to the program as well as flexibility. Uh, in years past, as you might recall, we've had some divisions that have actually had more applications then there was funding for each individual uh, uh, division. And in that case, it was up to the board whether they wanted to fluctuate and, and shift funds to, to potentially a different division. However, at the end of the fiscal year, uh, a new year begins, and we have budgeted for this program to be included next year. And so at the end of this year, and I think, I don't know if Margaret is on, uh, she might be able to provide the, the more technical aspects of budgeting, uh, but at the end of this year, uh, the funds that have been expended this year will, will be done. However, the board would have that decision whether they want to roll that money over and increase the budget in the next fiscal year. Yeah. So EJ, I hope they answer, sir. Yeah, EJ, the, the question, do we have grant funding? I, maybe I missed that. Do we? No, th this program is not funded through a grant. Okay, oh, it's, it's in our budget. Is that correct? Is that the That's funding? correct. Okay. Correct. Great. All right. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, EJ. Okay. Okay. Next. Okay, so, and thank you for remembering uh, Dr. Williams uh, the, to ask Gloria that question. We almost left her off. <laughs> Um, if we can move back to item 6A now, back to uh, Janelle. And um, I just love this program, um, the Waters Life Student Art Contest. I know the board does, and President Williams, normally we would be, we would be showing off the, uh, the art here in the building, but we're not doing it this year. But uh, we are, we can see it all online and, and vote on it. And um, our uh, education coordinator, uh, Janelle Ankayan is here to give us a sort of a, a schedule and give us a, a, an update. And, and Janelle, just so as you know, I did vote this morning. I don't know how these kids produce this kind of art, but it's, it's sensational. So there you go. They're amazing, right? Do you hear me okay, Patrick? Yes, loud and clear. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And good morning, Chairman and members of the board and committee. I will be covering agenda item 6A, which starts on page three of the agenda packet. Again, providing the committee an update of the Water is Live Student Art Contest, which again launched in, on Monday, January 11th, with a deadline on Friday, March 19th. This year, in an effort to support students throughout this unique distance learning environment, West Basin staff implemented a number of changes, including updating the paper size to eight and a half by 11, allowing the online submissions of entries via email, creating pre-recorded video content, and piloting live online classroom art lessons uh, which have served 60 classes and over 1,400 students. As of last week, submissions, all submissions have now been processed, so I will be, I will be providing a high-level participation summary. Please note that a more detailed breakdown of participation by division and school will be provided at the next committee meeting. So this year, we have received a total of 438 submissions compared to 486 submissions last year. So not a drastic decline despite a challenging school year. The breakdown by division is division one, 145 submissions, division two, 30 submissions, division three, 90 submissions, division four, 108 submissions, and division five, 65 submissions. Overall, we are very impressed with the quality and quantity of submissions despite such a challenging school year. In May, one grand prize winner will be awarded in each elementary, middle, and high school grade level category for a total of three grand prize winners. The grand prize is an Apple iPad, $25 gift card, and a stylus. Up to four honorable mentions are awarded in the same grade level categories who each receive an iPad. All winning submissions will also move on to the Metropolitan Water District's Regional Water is Life Art Contest, where selected artwork will be showcased in the 2022 Water is Life Art Calendars. We plan to accomplish the following milestones, and by tomorrow, April 9th, all staff in West Basin will choose, uh, will select the top 15 finalists. There will be a Facebook popular vote from Friday, April 16th to Friday, April 23, where members of the public will be encouraged to vote for their favorite submissions. The results from the popular vote will be available to directors and sponsors. We'll be selecting the grand prize winners from Monday, April 26th through Friday, April 30th. From then, I will arrange a courier to deliver prizes to student homes. This year, in place of an in-person student recognition event, I will be working with student winners and their families to produce pre-recorded video presentations that introduces each student winner and the inspiration behind their artwork. The pre-recorded video presentation will be shared at the May board meeting where directors will be provided with talking points and have an opportunity to express praise for the student winners. Please note, students will not be attending the board meeting, but staff has opted for pre-recorded video content in an effort to increase video content that we can use for future promotional purposes. In addition, many students are facing changing schedules with a potential return to the classroom with hybrid learning. And additionally, in December, Met did hold a live student recognition event, which was held online, but student participation was limited because it was during school hours. So we hope going the route of pre-recorded video content will ensure all of our 15 student winners are recognized equally. After the board meeting presentation, we still plan to recognize our student winners through an online web news articles and social media. Again, we are very pleased with the results of this year's contest and are excited to include the directors in the voting process in the next few weeks. If there are any questions at this time, I am happy to answer them. Otherwise, that concludes my presentation. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, directors. I do have a question, please. And Director Gray. Yes, thank you for the report this morning. Um, uh, I noticed D Division Two had, I think you said 30 some um, submissions. Is that significantly, le significantly less than last time? It's around the same time as last year. Last year we received 39 submissions from Division Two. Um, what is interesting though is that uh, Division Two we serve the highest number of students through our the second highest number of students through our lesson, serving about 341 students. Um, there was just a smaller number of students that actually followed through and submitted in uh, entry into the art contest. But we understand because again, it has been a challenging school year. Yeah, but but are you saying that's kind of usual for them? Their submission about 39. So do you know why it's so low compared to some of the other divisions in the past? And maybe that's something you guys can work on trying to figure out how to increase that number. Uh, and it may be, you know, certainly whatever's happening within the system. Yes, uh, historically, Division Two does have a um, lower, num lower number of submissions by uh, division. But again, um, this was a challenging school year. We tried to make outreach to the students by providing the art lessons, but uh, we, we figured that it just wasn't top of the priority with all the challenges going on. But in the summer and into the next school year, we look forward to uh, strengthening our relationships with educators in Division Two to hopefully increase that number for next year's art contest. Well, maybe you can come back to at least to the board and maybe give me a brief report on some of your efforts, your suggestions or recommendations to that district, because it is, you know, I know there's some challenges there, but maybe you could report on it and, and see whether or not there's some things that we can do to help encourage the kids uh, to do, to be able to submit their, uh, their artwork, because in every school district, there's a lot of talent. So we just don't want to yes. miss them to miss the opportunity. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Director Deer? No, thank you. Okay, very good. I, I know that uh, Division One, um, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of kids uh, participating in the program. So um, I, I, um, I look forward to, um, to, judging some of that artwork. It's, it's very good, always. So yep. thank you. Next item. Alrighty, and just uh, like I said, I voted this morning and it was, um, like you say, Director Williams, it was as good if not better than before, it's incredible. So um, if that's something very nice to look forward to. So item, the next item on the agenda is- um, Wait, just, just a minute before you go. Yeah. Before you go, I'd say we have a guest uh, water board director out there from, uh, Central, from Basin. Central, Central Basin. Correct. Hi. How are you, Director Vasquez Wilson? Welcome. Okay. So, yeah, sorry I didn't uh, introduce you, um, the Director uh, uh, Vasquez, but uh, thank you, Harold, for catching that. All right, very good, thank you. Um, okay, so that brings us back um, to item 6B. And uh, we've had some uh, robust discussion uh, uh, on this item, which is the district events update, particularly the water harvest, which is a uh, kind of main feature here. And, uh, you know, it's one of our signature events. And um, of course, we had to cancel it last year because of the pandemic. And we're in the early stages now of considering what lies ahead for this um, for this particular year. And we have a tag team of, um, every time I say tag team, I think of that Geico commercial, you know, scoop, there it is. But a tag team of Amy and, uh, um, that wasn't bad, Harold, right? A team of, of Amy and Daryl, who are gonna go over the considerations that have to be looked into considering the pandemic and the planning and the budget and all of that. So our, um, wonderful manager of uh, communications, Amy Rocha, 
and her tag team partner, Daryl, who's also a wonderful public information specialist. Three, uh, Amy, take it away, please. Great, thank you very much, Patrick, and uh, good morning, members of the board and committee. Uh, so this is a continuation of our discussion from last PI committee, and uh, we're just continuing to you know, provide updates and details. So lot, lots to keep track of, of, as you've probably seen in the news, um, various updates uh, starting April 2nd um, about the various uh, health and safety precautions in the pandemic. Uh, so I will be starting uh, item 6B on uh, packet page five here. And um, basically, you know, we're just trying to figure out how to move forward um, with the 2021 festival, what format, um, what kind of scale that we want to pursue. And that will help staff, um, guide staff in, you know, uh, what uh, resources and planning efforts to take. So uh, typically our staff begins vendor procurement processes now to pick a, an event coordinator to help us with the logistics of the event. Um, and so this is something that we are would like to pursue, uh, I think, um, we don't really want to waste any time if we do want to pursue a fall event, and and the timing is now. So um, we are coming back to the to the committee with some considerations for hosting a modified event, and want to provide highlights of, with some of the considerations in mind. So um, when these uh, memo items were uh, submitted for review, this was back in um, the end of March. There, so already, like I mentioned, there's been several updates, but um, we were specifically asked about the tier system. System. So that is currently in place. Um, however, uh, as of April 2nd, uh, the um, state and governor did make an announcement that California will retire its color-coded pandemic tier system uh, effective June 15th. But um, I still want to uh, note some of the elements and considerations for event planning. Um, that's according to the County of Los Angeles. Um, and some of the highlights here in terms of the, you know, risk levels, um, you know, recent news moved us down to the orange tier, and that's considered moderate, and that's based on the number of new daily cases and positive positive COVID test results. Um, so it's the second most lenient tier of the four um, categories. And um, just this week, uh, or actually on April 2nd, there were some new guidelines um, for uh, protocols for outdoor seated live events, amusement parks, and then in addition, a separate set of protocols for museums, aquariums, et cetera. So you're, we're starting to see um, more guidance on bigger venues with, with public events. Um, so they're modified and there's still, um, you know, specific checklists that really cover policies in place to protect employee health, measures to, you know, ensure physical uh, distancing, uh, ways of ensuring uh, infection control and notifications, um, communication with the employees and, and public about these protocols, and um, measures, you know, to, to make sure we're, we're um, ensuring just access to critical services. So um, that's a little bit about, um, you know, the, the county. Um, the California Department of Public Health also issued another set of guidelines, so a lot to keep ta uh, tabs on, a blueprint for a safer economy and reopening framework. And this has some guidance um, with uh, some effects uh, taking place as of April 15th. And this provides some information on private events, meetings, receptions, and conferences. Um, so this, again, this is not in the staff report here because this was added recently. But um, for example, this would kind of help inform an event like a, a festival for ex, uh, that we're considering. So in, in the, according to this framework, you know, if you're in the orange tier, outdoor gatherings are limited to 100 people uh, and capacity would then increase to 300 people if all guests are tested for COVID or show proof of full vaccination. And then in this uh, red tier, um, you know, it's a little bit fewer people, but that just shows you some of the considerations in terms of proof of vaccination and testing that are in place. Um, I'd have to get clarification. Hey, Amy, Amy, if I could just ask you on that note, you have those uh, numbers, one, 100 to up to 300 if there's testing and proof of vaccination. Um, historically, I think, as I recall, the numbers that we've attracted are between one and 2,000, right? Is that 
Right? Yeah, um, I would say the higher end is about, uh, well, typically I would say 1200 or so, um, it, you know, so again, that would, it, capacity is the big question and, and how many people were able to serve and what our footprint is going to be, because um, regardless of whether the state is opening up as a whole, you know, we're still going to expect some guidelines and restrictions that we're going to have to work within, um, you know, of course, the, the masking and, and whatnot, but also um, the capacities. So uh, thank you for that question. So we basically just are keeping on our toes, keeping tabs on, on things. Um, and then this would also include how our schools are operating because the Water Harvest Festival is a family event. We have a lot of children and kids that are participating and they are not eligible for the vaccine uh, as of yet. Um, so also kind of staying in touch with how our school districts are operating provides us some insight as well. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Daryl um, as, you know, head of our education programs. You know, he, he's uh, especially well tuned into what's happening here. So Daryl, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you at this point. Thanks, Amy. And good morning, President Williams and members of the board. I'm hoping that you're all staying safe and are well. Since the Water Harvest Festival seeks to serve students and families, I'd like to provide an update on school district reopenings and projections for the fall, which we are currently considering with our event planning. 14 school districts are located in the West Basin Service Area. A majority of school districts are currently or beginning to offer some form of in-person classroom instructions to families who prefer that option. Listed at the bottom of packet page five are the LA County reopening protocols for kindergarten through 12th grade schools, which include physical distancing of three feet between seated students, six feet between students and teachers, six feet between students when masks are removed for eating. This also includes assigning students um, to one small cohort group while on campus for the rest of the school year. Um, to limit COVID transmission. Cohort groups must stay six feet away from other cohort groups, and an individual teacher may not interact or instruct more than two cohort groups. So due to the restriction on classroom capacity, a limited number of students are allowed in a classroom at one time. Um, of course, this means that some schools are implementing a schedule in which Cohort A arrives on campus in the morning for instruction, with cohort B arriving in the afternoon. And class size is ranging between 10 to 15 students, depending on the footprint of individual classrooms. And then there's a cohort C who remains in distant learning for the rest of the school year by assignment to a new teacher. Now, other schools are requiring teachers to instruct uh, students in person in the morning therefore turning away all the other students once the room capacity is met and then that teacher needs to um, instruct the rest of the students from home in the afternoons now secondary students with multiple class period schedules are finding this cohort approach even more difficult um, some examples of middle schools and high schools of undertaking uh, in-person education may include in-person instruction in which students come to their homeroom class, remain there the whole day, while they are on their devices uh, learning from their other multiple period teachers during the day. And the homeroom teacher in that class is also instructing remotely from his or her, her own device to the other students in the other classrooms or from home. So that's why for secondary students, many of those schools aren't opening, may have no plans to reopen, or are currently trying to figure out how to reopen later this month or next month in some way or fashion. Um, regular disinfection of high contact services, replacing HVAC systems, figuring out student transportation, drop off and pick up areas with minimal gathering numbers, and after school care are all issues the schools are attempting to address. As a result, the last couple of weeks of the school year leading to the summer break are a very trying time for families, faculty, and school administrators. Statewide, 2 million students in California have an option for in-person instruction out of the 6 million school-age population. So it's a fact that this year, 
most students will never meet their teacher in person or know where their physical classroom is located on campus, unfortunately. Now, regarding vaccinations, approximately 20 million vaccinations have been distributed. 34% of California residents have received one shot. 18% are fully vaccinated. Now, vaccination access to teachers has improved once educators became eligible for, uh, became eligible in mid-March, and many teachers are receiving their second shot this month, easing the anxiety of those teachers assigned to return to school. So that's a very good thing. Vaccination access for adults and school families, however, remain a challenge and demonstrates the disparity between disadvantaged communities and those that are more affluent. Lower income communities who have been heavily impacted by COVID infections and deaths have limited access to shot appointments and have expressed the preference to keeping their children in distant learning both for fear of infection and not being able to accommodate the new half-day in-person classroom drop-off and pickup schedules that are required by elementary schools, for example. Now, we, you already heard that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine is available for 18-year-olds and older, and the Johnson & Johnson one-shot is approved for 16 years and older. Vaccine trials are currently underway for adolescents and children. It is expected that vaccinations for children will take place in early 2022. Noteworthy is that children have been identified as a vector for transmitting the new COVID variant, which is more contagious and a deadly form, which is spreading in the Midwest and East Coast currently. Here in California, the next two months will be critical in monitoring the containment or spread of COVID and where the children will become the vector or victims, unfortunately, of the new COVID variant. If COVID infection and hospitalizations decrease, the physical distancing requirements among children may be eased and full capacity classrooms may be allowed to resume in the fall. And a full scale water harvest festival may be possible without the social distancing and safety requirements. Um, it should also be noted that researchers currently believe vaccines provide at least six months of immunity or until the month of October for those individuals vaccinated this month. So further data will be collected over the summer to determine if adults will need booster shots. However, as I already stated, due to the rigor of clinical trials for the vaccine, children will not be expected to be vaccinated until January 2022. So with that, I'd like to invite Amy to share what other agencies are planning for their, their upcoming special events. Thank you, Gerald. That's a lot of great information. And yeah, it just goes to show once things are open, you know, there's still all these elements in place. That was a lot of information. So actually, I'll pause to see if there's any questions from the directors about the school component, and then I'll get into what other agencies are doing. Director Deere, since you have a school background, um, questions? It's all very interesting, but I appreciate the information. No questions. Thank you. How about uh, Director Gray? No, thank you. Great information from staff. Thank you so much. Yeah, wonderful. A uh, lot to consider. So uh, thank you very much for that. Okay. Thank you, um, President Williams. Let me continue on with what some of the other agencies are doing. Um, so in our LA County area is the Water Replenishment District. They typically hold their groundwater festival, also geared toward families and children uh, in May. And last year they canceled it like so many of us did. And there has been no formal decision made about the 2021 event. And sorry, I'm on packet page six. Um, and then as for Upper San Gabriel Municipal Water District, um, they host a water fest as well, also around the October timeframe and no formal decision uh, has been made about 2021. Um, they are considering an online alternative. Uh, the Orange County Water District will be hosting the OC Water Summit. Uh, they just had their newsletter announcing the October 15th date. Um, now, this is a little bit different because this is for, um, you know, elected officials, water professionals, adults, um, and it's a professional event. Um, but the board did approve an in-person event. It'll be held in, at the one of the Disneyland ballrooms. Um, and then 
for Metropolitan, you know, we've we've heard from Janelle about the solar cup boat races that, you know, it's an online program. And then also in Elsinore Valley, uh, the water district there has a March uh, splash into uh, spring event. And that was um, postponed uh, till May um, with some alternative options that they're considering. So, um, Again, we're, you know, unlike Orange County, they're, they're LA, Orange County Public Health, and we're under LA County Public Health guidances, but that just gives you, um, you know, a snapshot of, of what some of these other districts are doing. So what I'll transition to next uh, um, is just a brief overview of some of our staff recommendations and considerations, and then Daryl will take uh, the, the lead on going through the individual tables that present uh, specific pros and cons about our options. Uh, so at this point, yeah, we're trying to, you know, essentially get some guidance, uh, like I was saying earlier, about kind of where we want to go, uh, when we want to go there. So um, our potential event direction options is uh, staff would recommend a modified event, um, really kind of focusing on more virtual elements, um, you know, again, protecting, uh, you know, the community and 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 staff um, health, you know, with that in mind. Um, so that would be, you know, same timing, um, but just with more uh, virtual elements. The other alternative, like we did last year, was to cancel. Um, and then thirdly is to postpone until spring uh, of March, um, of spring of 2022, uh, after so basically after the fall, and uh, then we have some tables that you know give those options of what um, hybrids would look like, as well as some information about our traditional in-person event. So with that, I will um, hand it over to Daryl to cover those specifics. Thanks, Amy. On packet page seven, you can see table number two, which describes the full virtual event. The estimated event production services would be approximately $30,000 for a one-day online event on the social media platform. Um, table three offers um, an overview for a possible hybrid event with a cost of $50,000, which would include um, all online platform event combined with, for example, a drive-through pickup pick giveaway event at our facilities to provide a little bit more um, interaction for our guests. Table four, an online campaign, which is basically an online event but carried out through a whole week. That can include some live um, footage, I mean, live streaming um, activities as well as pre-recorded video footage or, or rec recorded video, video footage from our own um, library resources. On packet page eight is the estimated cost for an in-person event for production event services at $75,000. And basically it includes their coordinating expenses as well as tents, porta potties, you know, stage, sound system, DJ, um, helping coordinating with the um, event permitting and other tasks such as that. This would be our traditional type of event. Um, but it's important to note that this estimated cost does not include um, other expenses such as advertising or the promotional uh, collateral giveaway items, food, um, transportation, or the rental of the parking structure, for example. For um, all those elements, it would be projected to add another $25,000 to $30,000 um, for the full scale um, event and quality that we're all used to um, producing. So those are the pros and cons that we're currently exploring. Um, we're looking at bringing on um, a vendor who can be nimble enough to be able to go in either direction, depending on the COVID health requirements by the state and LA County to go either towards live, go towards virtual, or a combination of both. So it's a very dynamic environment that we are working in and trying to monitor everything that's um, in process and it's constantly evolving and will continue to evolve over the summer. And with that, I'd like to invite Amy back to see if she has any further comments um, before we open it up for any questions or recommendations from the board. Daryl, if I may, I have a question for you. you put four options in front of the, the committee here. 
uh, although this is not a national item. Um, the, um, can you enlighten me on what, what is the difference between a fully virtual event and an online campaign? I think I got it, but just, I thought we were one in the same, but what, what are the essential difference? What's fully virtual and what's just online? For me, a fully virtual event can be an online campaign, but it's a, the duration of the event. One, the table number two is just lasting for one day versus a multi-day uh, campaign. Um, you're talking about a week-long event that can be having activities ranging all day long for a whole week versus a simple one-day, four-hour online event. Does that um, make sense? Um, Patrick, are you on mute? Yeah, thank you, Daryl. I, I sound better when I'm on mute. <laughs> that, that explains it. That was a good answer to my uh, dumb question, really. But I, I noticed that you don't have any estimated service costs for the online campaign. Will, will, we, will we get those at some at some point? You have thirty thousand dollars for the fully virtual and to be determined, I guess. When would yeah. we? Have? Um, our our projected expenses would be between twenty five thousand to thirty thousand dollars simply for the pr production services. You know, the online um, platform as well as coordinating the weeks of events. It really depends on whether we're doing, we're using and take advantage of, taking advantage of um, pre-recorded already existing um, recordings or if we're producing um, footage that's brand new that will be showed later or if we're transmitting live. Thank you. I have a question. Go ahead, Don. Uh, how how much time do we have before we have to make a final decision on the subject? I can I can answer that, Director Deere. Um, well, you know we're we're trying to. This is the time where we usually make a decision. Um, so I would say the time is now, <laughs> or very very soon. Um, again, just so that you know we can get on board an event services uh, production company that has the capabilities to either do it in person or virtual events so we're finding the right um, you know type of, of support um, you know the, the procurement process because I think what would you know eventually happen is that uh, you know we we'll, we plan for the programming and then just modify based on whatever the restrictions are at the time um, so really I would say in the next um, month or so within the month would be uh, very helpful. Mm. Director. Again, Director Andre. Um, if we're trying to look at making a decision within 30 days, my recommendation is to do the online um, event. I would not suggest that we look at any kind of hybrid at this point. We're not even sure what the governor's position will be in June. I know what he has said at the moment, and and he did have a caveat as part of saying, if in fact there's no other outbreak, then the, 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 the state will be open. So to me, that means that nothing is stable now, and so I'd hate to see us Look, make a commitment to try to do something online and in person also, a hybrid at this point. But I think to be safe for me, I would recommend you know, hiring someone that could do an online virtual, not a virtual, well, an online virtual one day, not the continuous one week, because water harvest has only been for one day anyway, so I don't see the need to do it, uh, a full week of activities. Um, and uh, uh, but I think the uh, uh, the company or person we hire should be nimble enough or flexible enough that if things do open up to some degree that we could do some uh, in person or, or I think you suggested some giveaways or something like that. But I would hate for us to move forward with trying to do an in person event with with things being so unstable at this morning at this point rather uh, things are certainly better with vaccination, but we just don't know what that number will be. And we certainly don't want to put children at risk. And I'm not sure how it would, would work that we would 
make sure that anyone who attends has been vaccinated or or whatever. So I, I think that's a little cumbersome. So just to be safe, I would support just an online version at this point. Thank you. I I, I I agree, Director Gray. Uh, makes a lot of sense, as usual. Hey, Director dear. I wanted to say, I, I, I think uh, Director Gray makes good points on this one. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, I agree that uh, there definitely should not be an in-person um, event. And I don't know, and the virtual having something over several days, I've been to some of those and, and they never worked. No one has ever been there. They sign on for the first part of it and they don't come back. So that would be nonsense to, to do that. The um, And I don't know if um, a one day uh, deal online would be beneficial either. So I, I would be looking at just canceling it all together and, and put our energies in uh, 20, 2022 but that's we're just giving just stating something we're not giving you direction yeah but, um, just feedback yeah that's good i mean very helpful because you know you. i think of a festival you know that's a fun thing you know and if you put the kids in an environment where uh, you're supposed to come here and have fun but don't have too much fun because uh you, you might get sick you know that's kind of like nonsense so but i i think if we wait until 2022 and uh, we'll know how how people re react after being uh, cooped up for uh, a year or two years and they come out and uh, and they're a little, little easier to uh, to uh, deal with so uh, yeah I, I would uh, definitely not go for the in person and definitely not the uh, virtual thing over several days. And I kind of the one day uh, online, but I don't think kids would enjoy that. I, I think it would, that we should just cancel it all together and, and focus on uh, 2022. Thank you. That's my two cents. President uh, Williams, can I just ask a question? Sure. Or make a comment. Um, do the staff have any idea of what an uh, what a one day online event would be for the festival, or could you guys bring something back or an idea of what kinds of things that that and I speaking to the president's point, things that kids may enjoy online? Yes, definitely, Director Gray, and I think that's what we were trying to achieve today is just a, a general leaning and preferences, um, because that will allow staff to really pursue, for example, the fully virtual event, um, what level of detail, what kind of budget we're talking about. I mean, we projected the budget, but, you know, with um, a little bit more focus and uh, we mm -hmm. can kind of provide some more detail. So we can bring back, um, you know, what a kid-friendly virtual event uh, for one day might like. be. Yeah. And, and are there any other events like that have happened in the past since this, since the pandemic, if you know of, maybe? Come back. I see Daryl raise his hand. Go ahead, Daryl. The Orange County Water District is going to be conducting their Environmental Youth Summit um, this month. It's um, they're going to be having guest speakers and entertainers streaming live and offering pre-recorded footage also. So it could be as simple as you know us either providing um, a live streamed facility tour as we're currently doing with the school tours. We usually have the Discovery Cube offering short stage shows. So whether it's pre-recording them or transmitting them live, those are all some of the things that we can work out and bring back to you for further discussion. Yeah. I know kids are used to being online now because that's what they do in school, but back to the president's point, what fun things can they do online? So I look forward to the information being brought back. Thank you. We'll, we'll do that. Darrell, quick follow-up question. What's the target for that OCWD? Is it all grades? 
So you said, you said climate use summit? Yes, it's third through fifth grade. Unlike ours, which is a family festival, that program is geared towards teachers and their students, where busloads of students typically arrive at their venue. So this year, since it's all online, they're coordinating with the teachers which sessions um, the teachers will be tuning into um, during the day for their um, program. Thank you. President Williams? Yes. Any, uh, we do, do we move on to the next item? I think we've gotten enough input. I, I think so. Yeah, that's been very helpful for staff. Um, like I said, no decision been made, but that's, we sort of got, as Amy said, the leading, and, and we have a couple of items to uh, actually to follow up with information to bring back, which we will do at the next uh, high committee, Amy. Thank you. Okay. So our next item, that was item 6B on our information calendar. Item uh, uh, 6C <coughs> is um, uh, our, our communication and media report update. When we have Deanne Blackman, I see her there. Um, um, our uh, public information specialist too, I think, and Amy's gonna tag team with her on this particular item. And uh, I know the last time, Deanne, we had the pleasure of, of hearing your dog. How's he doing? He was in the background. <laughs> Yeah, he is in the other room today. <laughs> oh, he's a lovely little guy. Thank you. Thank you, General Manager, and good morning, members of the board and committee. I'll be covering the communications and media activities that include press releases issued, media coverage, website updates, and I'll be ending with the district social media highlights, starting on packet page 12. The district's communications activities from the past month are listed here which include press releases, web news stories, and a public notice on page 13. The press releases include the Rain Barrel Home Delivery Program announcement, the SoFi Stadium Recycled Water Project Water Reuse Award for Excellence <laughs> announcement, Firescaping Workshop announcement, um, which was also featured in an ad um, that went out today in the Palos Verdes Peninsula News. So um, we also had some web news stories here updated workforce diversity report on the district website, an article that was in the winter 2021 issue of the South Bay Environmental Services Center newsletter about why water bottle filling stations are good for our health and the environment. Um, and that clip is actually included on packet page 30 of the clip. Handout. And then finally, the announcement of the spring workshops for the district's water lab. And on packet page 13, We've listed the public notice communicating that West Basin is in the process of preparing and updating its 2020 urban water management plan. Moving on to packet page 14, we have some images of the three press releases that we just mentioned. And on packet page 15, some media coverage from the press releases that were listed on packet pages 15 and 16, um, with the actual clips from this coverage being included in the handout beginning on packet page 29. So we have some clips about um, South Bay Cog being honored for their fiber network. West Basin was mentioned there. West Basin offering the free rain barrel home delivery program and Malibu city managers update. And then some additional industry news, water online and aqua um, for the SoFi Stadium recycled water project. And then of course the rain barrel home delivery engine, the Argonaut. So on the next page, packet page 15, or sorry, excuse me. Like it's page 17, 18 are snapshots of the web news stories and the public notice. And additionally, we wanted to highlight on packet page 18, I'm sorry, on packet page 19, we wanted to highlight and add that our education team placed in the Los Angeles County School Superintendent's paper, promoting the district's free water education programs, including the district's water bottle filling station grant that schools can apply for. And it was actually featured on the same page with Hawthorne and Hermosa Beach. So got some additional advertising there, not just necessarily our education programs, but also our water conservation programs. So great opportunity there from our education team. And moving on to packet page 21. Listed are some upcoming opportunities for communications. We um, which include the spring e-newsletter, which we're working with the general manager to get out this month, as well as the April 21st Palos Verdes Peninsula Firescaping class that I mentioned earlier, the district's annual advertisement campaign, which is geared towards Earth Day, 
the Water is Life Art Contest, in which we're in the process of, of selecting winners, and finally, the district's operating budget, which we usually share the workshops on our website um, and in the development of the e-newsletter. If there are any questions about these, I'd be glad to answer them before moving on to the social media highlights on packet page 23. Not hearing any. All right, awesome. So moving on to packet page 23, we know that March was Women's History Month and the district dedicated a few posts to it. Um, here's some social media highlights, uh, including this post highlighted here that showcases the Dominguez sisters and provides some insight as to how these sisters impacted the development of the South Bay through their individual families. Also highlighted is it um, Suez's post for World Water Day, which was March 22nd, that highlights West Basin's water recycling program. And finally, for World Water Day, the district accepted the Water Reuse Award for Excellence for its SoFi Stadium Recycled Water Project, and we shared that on our social media platforms as well. Moving on to packet page 24, I'll be sharing some highlights from the individual platforms, such as the district's Twitter. The page earned over 2,000 impressions and continues to see an increase in followers. And the most popular post announced the launch of the Rain Barrel Home Delivery Program. On packet page 25, the district's Facebook page had over 17,000 impressions and over 80 clicks on the links that we post. And the most popular post was the message from West Basin Board President Harold Williams addressing Black History Month and Engineers Week. Moving on to packet page 26, similar to Facebook, the district Instagram page also continues to see gradual increases in impressions as well as engagement with our posts. And the most popular post was also the message from West Basin Board President um, addressing Black History Month and Engineers Week. And finally, on packet page 27, the district's LinkedIn page continues to see an increase in followers as well. We've increased our following in the past month to a total of 914 followers. So almost at that thousand mark um, that we're hoping to see. The most popular post was the Engineers Week post linking to the district's web news story, highlighting a few of the district's engineers, which was strictly voluntary. And we do appreciate everyone that was involved in the coordination and execution of our Engineers Week social media activities um, back in February. And these were highlighted in last month's by committee meeting. So that concludes the, my communications and media update. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Very good, very good report. Um, any questions, comments? Again, uh, thank you very much for great that report. excellent work. Thank you. This comment, great report. Yeah. Hey, how, how does uh, come back? Question: How do uh, what kind of, uh, of education do you need to have a wonderful position like you have? Uh, the reason I'm asking because I have a, a granddaughter who is who met you once, and she wants she wants to know about that, how to get to where you are. Well, I would be more than happy to share my information with her and let her know exactly how she can get in the communications industry if she wants to reach out to me directly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next. Okay, um, that concludes that item. That brings us to um, uh, our uh, final item here, 6D, uh, which is the... Uh, the conservation pro program update and we have there he is our great uh, senior water policy and resources uh, analyst uh, gus mesa yes. and uh, ably accompanied by jennifer vasquez who's also online and we're doing the second part another tag team thank you uh, patrick water policy and resource analyst too jennifer will be coming on later so uh, gus please uh and yes. thank you patrick uh and uh, good afternoon uh Chairman Williams, committee, and board members. Um, I have a few updates on our water efficiency programs, and then I'll be uh, handing this over to Jennifer Vasquez uh, for her updates. Uh, the first update is on our change and save program, uh, which is shown on your board, pa uh, board packet page 53 under the program highlights section. Uh, this is a DWR grant funded program uh, that targets our disadvantaged communities. And as, as of this week, 
uh, our consultant, Allegra Consulting, um, has conducted 236 online water efficiency surveys, and they've mailed out 212 conservation kits to our residents, and also uh, 121 residents have applied and received the $500 uh, clothes washer rebate. Wow, nice. Yeah, that's uh, great news. Um, as part of the program, um, Allegra Consulting, uh, they're working with staff to host several webinars uh, for residents uh, to help them uh, understand the program and uh, understand how to participate in the program and how to apply uh, for the rebates. And uh, we do a lot of work uh, as well, Allegra and the South Bay Environmental Services Center with assisting residents, uh, creating the accounts, answering their questions. Uh, so they're doing a great job there. Um, and at our March 24th webinar um, that Allegra hosted, we had 54 RSVPs and 34 actual attendees. Uh, that actually led to 23 surveys, uh, 23 kits uh, being mailed out, and one uh, clothes washer rebate application. Um, our next uh, water efficiency webinar uh, will be held on Earth Day, which is April 22nd at 6 p.m. Uh, we'll be providing uh, the board uh, with information on how to register uh, for that webinar, uh, working through uh, board services. And also, uh, uh, Chairman Williams uh, uh, staff will be uh, providing you with information, more details about that, uh, that webinar uh, to see if uh, you would like to uh, welcome the guests. And so I'll work through uh, board services to provide you more uh, details about that Earth Day uh, webinar on April 22nd at 6 p.m. Uh, these webinars are in addition to all the marketing efforts that are being conducted by West Basin, Allegra Consulting, and the South Bay Environmental Services Center. Um, as part of this board memo, staff has also provided a two-page attachment that provides more details on the program metrics and all the marketing efforts uh, that are happening. Uh, so that is my report on this uh, program. Um, um, are there any questions? No, not hearing any guests, go ahead. Okay, thank you, I'll uh, continue on. Uh, the next update is our Malibu Smart, Topanga Smart program showing up page 54. I just have a, a brief update on this program. Uh, the program is 94% complete. Uh, we're currently working with our partners, uh, the city of Malibu, Valley County Waterworks, uh, to promote the program through social media, websites, emails, and we're currently working with them to create a new infographic uh, a campaign for this summer with some new messaging um, on uh, how they can, how residents can help us uh, get to the finish line. Uh, we're, we're close, 94% uh, project completed, uh, so we'll be launching that uh, this uh, uh, late spring, summertime in Malibu at Topanga. Uh, so that is my update there. And I can continue on. Um, the next program is our uh, this Palos Verdes Peninsula Firescaping webinar, uh, which is shown on your uh, packet page 54. And this webinar is scheduled for April 21st, uh, one day before Earth Day, at 6 p.m. Um, and currently we have already 45 people have registered. Uh, we're working, um, yeah, it's great news. We're working with mm -hmm. our cities, uh, our partners, uh, California Water Service Company, is helping us to get the word out. Uh, the South Bay Environmental Services Center sent out an e-blast, and um, our public information department using social media. We're we're getting the word out uh, to all the residents uh, on the Palos Verdes uh, Peninsula and the LA County areas. There, uh, we're also working with uh, Charles Gale from MWD, and he's helping us to uh, provide the information to all his contacts in the area. Um, Let's see here. So our next steps uh, are to continue the planning and marketing uh, efforts um, and to hold a rehearsal on April 15th at uh, 2.30 uh, p.m. And uh, uh, Melissa Boidia from our Public Information Department is, is leading the charge uh, on, this, uh, on this webinar. And so uh, we'll be providing you, uh, Director Williams, if, if she hasn't done so already, with information about that rehearsal on, mm -hmm. on April 15th at uh, 2.30 p.m. And um, I'll pause here to see if there's any questions. 
Questions? Okay. Seeing none, go ahead, uh, Gus. Thank you. My last program is uh, covering the uh, Ray Barrel Home Delivery Pilot Program, uh, which is shown on your packet page 55. Um, we're very excited to report that as of today, we have 376 registrations with 584 rain barrels scheduled to be delivered starting tomorrow. Uh, some residents get one uh, rain barrel, some request two, two is the max. So we're uh, well over 50% of reaching our goal of uh, delivering a thousand rain barrels. And uh, this memo provides uh, numbers uh, by division as of March 11th, um, as you can see in the memo. Uh, but we do have some updated numbers um, as of today. And for Division 1, uh, we have 118 registrants with 189 rain barrels. Division 2, we have 16 registrants with 28 rain barrels. Uh, Division 3, we have 112 registrants with 163 rain barrels. Uh, Division 4, we have 104 registrants with 162 rain barrels. At Division 5, we have 26 registrants uh, with 42 rain barrels. And so this is uh, due to all the marketing efforts uh, with our launch of the program. Some cities uh, uh, have picked up this, the story, our press release, and put more information out. Palos Verdes, the city's there, the Beach Reporter. Um, we are reaching out uh, currently to um, our partners where the numbers are a bit lower. Divisions two, divisions uh, uh, five, uh, working with them. Um, uh, we also uh, recently we uh, interviewed with uh, Hawthorne TV, uh, and they're going to be running a story uh, starting uh, this week uh, uh, about the program. Uh, so we're very excited about that. Um, our public information department is uh, reaching out uh, to those areas uh, where the numbers are lower. Uh, through a social media campaign. Uh, so we've already started, we've already begun uh, to reach out uh, to those areas. Um, as mentioned, uh, directors, this is a pilot program. Uh, we launched the marketing uh, broadly throughout our entire uh, service area. And this is uh, how the, uh, the numbers are looking. Uh, so we're pivoting right now with our marketing. We're still marketing to the entire service area, but we're, we're doing a more strategic focus now on divisions uh, two and five in order to get those numbers up. Uh, so um, at this time, I could take any questions you may have. Any questions? No questions or comments, uh, President Maya. Director Graydon, yes. Yeah. Gus, thank you so much for your effort because I know this is different during the pandemic. So. Thank you for outreach effort and what you're going to continue to do. I know the numbers are low in D Division Two, uh, but I just want to say overall, thank you for your effort in doing this. Uh, doing this, thank you. Great, th thank you, thank you, Director Gray. You're welcome. None other. Go, go ahead, uh, Gus. Okay, thank you. And before I turn this over to uh, to Jennifer, um, I did want to mention, uh, directors, that uh, next month I will be bringing an action item uh, to the committee uh, for uh, for the contract for the South Bay City Council of Governments. Uh, we'll be uh, providing their accomplishments for this year, as we traditionally do every year, and then uh, providing information on the tasks and budgets for the upcoming uh, fiscal year. So uh, we'll be bringing an item uh, uh, next month. I just wanted to mention that, and I'll go ahead and uh, turn this over to Jennifer. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Gus. Uh, good afternoon, President Williams and members of the committee and board. I will begin at the bottom portion of packet page 55 with an update to the grass replacement rebate. Uh, this staff has included the rebate application table at the top of packet page 56. And please note that these totals begin in the fiscal year with applications received from July 1st, 2020. And the most updated download does reflect that a total of four applications were received in the month of March. Um, so the table doesn't fully reflect that. Um, the most uh, recent downloads did show a total of four. Uh, it does reach a total of 56 
applications received this fiscal year. And uh, West Basin Conservation staff, in collaboration with the Finance Department, did identify additional funds within the existing conservation budget, totaling 30000 to continue funding the residential program at the current rebate amount without impact any of the con other conservation programs. So we did mention that, you know, the funds were reaching um, that maximum level that was allocated and we were successfully able to identify additional funds to continue um, providing the additional $3 per square foot leading into the new fiscal year. So those, that's good news there. Um, as of February 2021, West Basin was billed for completed projects through Metropolitan's monthly invoice in the amount totaling $95,294. I, I believe that's an updated number from what you're seeing on the board packet, just based on the numbers we recently received in the past uh, week, past few weeks. Um, and then right below the application table, staff also included a summary image of the Metropolitan Conservation Activity as updated in the March joint meeting of the Water Planning and Stewardship Committee and Local Resource Resources Committee. And this again tracks regional devices, the turf replacement program, which is really what we want to highlight. Uh, the remaining funds there that you see is for the regional program at 63%, and that's always found on the Metropolitan website uh, telling residents how much funding is available for the regional turf replacement program. And it's something that we as staff always have an eye out for to make sure that their funds are available to uh, make that $3 per square foot uh, a reality. And so uh, moving into the grass replacement class section right below, uh, which is also on page 56, Metropolitan does continue offering three online class webinars, uh, which are listed on this page. Uh, they have introduced a Spanish and Mandarin option for the garden design workshop. And I believe also for the other two topics that are listed on this page uh, that will be introduced in April and also going into May. Um, so that will be the first of Metropolitan uh, to offer uh, the Mandarin option specifically. The Spanish option had been offered previously before for one of the topics, but it appears that they are attempting to provide those two classes more regularly in, in an ongoing format for the, the grass replacement program. So additional dates are now listed in the look ahead calendar within this board packet, but the, for the most uh, and latest updates, the Be Waterwise uh, website link that is listed there on the last bullet uh, will provide you with the list, of the most updated list for the, those uh, grass replacement classes. And so West Basin, of course, and staff will continue utilizing the marketing uh, pieces created by the California Friendly Plants campaign introduced by Metropolitan to promote the grass replacement classes and also the available rebate moving forward into the spring. And so I will take a brief pause at this time for any questions regarding the grass replacement uh, section, which includes the class and the rebate. Questions, directors? Seeing none, go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and move into Cash for Kitchens. And so that does begin at on board packet page 57. For Cash for Kitchens, uh, we have communicated with the United States Bureau of Reclamation and the Department of Water Resources regarding a possible grant extension for this program. Staff has received updates for, regarding COVID-19 related extensions from both of these agencies, and we're now working with West B, uh, they're working with West Basin to submit the required documentation. So I am I'm working with their staff there at both USVR and D. DWR for, for those grant extensions. Additional project time would be primarily utilized to complete all of the rebate applications for air-cooled ice machines, the Energy Star dishwashers, and the connectionless steamers, which are those big larger items um, included in these grants. And they recognize the challenges that restaurants are going and um, committing to a large purchase, for example, of these of ice machines. Uh, we're trying to be understanding of that uh, circumstance through this program. Um, so that's the additional time there that we're allotting for the for the program. And so in the month of March, West Basin staff collaborated with the program partner Screen Media Creations and the South Bay Cities Council of Governments to complete uh, the program's 
activities listed in the board packet. I did want to point out that a total of 41 water efficiency packages were distributed to restaurants and commercial kitchens with a total of 33 pre-rinse spray valves included within those packages and 147 faucet flow restrictors uh, also included within this, these packages. So we will continue maximizing any opportunities to promote the program and have recently created a significant collateral for upcoming Earth Day events uh, related to this program. And then lastly, moving on to ocean friendly gardens. Uh, the garden section beginning on board packet page 58. Swayzer Landscapes contract is set to expire on April 30th, 2021. West Basin staff continues to collaborate with their team to identify any additional maintenance visits that may be needed. So currently staff is working to complete a maintenance visit at Cal State University Dominguez Hills for the ocean friendly garden uh, site there. Um, West Basin is also, our staff is also drafting a new request for proposal to identify additional resources to offer ocean-friendly garden sites and staff moving forward. Uh, so current concept ideas include webinars, on-call maintenance services for these ocean-friendly gardens, and also design assistance for the existing and also potential future sites that may be interested in this type of landscaping. So that's uh, what will be drafted within the request for proposal uh, to acquire a new contractor uh, moving forward. Um, and that is my last update. I am happy to take any questions you may have at this time, and thank you for your time. Questions? See none. Thank you very much for your very, very comprehensive report and a good one. Thank you. Good Thank news. You. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. So, uh, Chairman Williams, we already covered uh, 6E. We brought that to the head of the uh, um, agenda today, unless you, the, the committee wants to hear it again. So, we, we already covered that one. And that brings us to item. Seven closed session, and we don't. Uh, closed is there a closed session today? Uh, there is none, Chairman Williams. None scheduled. Uh, that brings us to item eight uh, director's comments, future agenda items. Any, uh, any director's Please. comments? I, Director. Thank you. I just want to thank all the staff members who presented this morning. Thank you for the work that you do, continue to do under the circumstances. Um, very pleased and, and just um, thankful that you continue to do outstanding work. So thank you again, and to the general manager and his staff. Well, thank, thank you. For you. With those with those outstanding comments, I, I echo. Thank you very much. And so this brings us to uh, Wait a minute, how about me, the Director Don Deere. Director Deere. Yeah. Uh, as usual, Director Gray always says the right thing, and I, and I agree, Mr. Uh, Williams, uh, we uh, agree with our comments. But the second thing I wanted to do, uh, referring back to page 23, social media highlights, uh, the first third of that page is an article on the Dominguez sisters, a history article on them. Yeah. Uh, can you, uh, uh, staff, can you send me uh, that one uh, article in full size? Two copies of it, please. I have two people I want to give those to. Okay, we will take care of those. There's a small fee, but uh, we'll, well we're send that we're for that to Williams. <laughs> okay, two copies, full size. We got it. Thank you. That's all I have. All right, thank you. So, are there are no other comments. This meeting is adjourned.